Welcome, everybody, to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 82. We are bringing back our friend Kira Giles, who wrote the book Russia's War on Everybody. That book comes out in paperback this week. Giles is the senior consulting fellow of the Russia and Eurasia program of Chatham House and a very good friend of RadPod. Let's bring him in. Oh, Kier, we are so happy to have you back with us. It's been about a year. So much has happened. And before we jump into updates on your book, Russia's War on Everybody, there has been a bit of a breaker this morning. And can you tell us about uh, the shooting down of Ill-76 and how that ties into essentially your area of expertise on information warfare? Well, there's not a great deal I can tell you about the shooting down, and that's rather the point, because all of the disinformation that is swirling about what has happened shows so many of the the themes that we've talked about previously, about how disinformation works, where the audiences for it are, where the willing conduits for it are in terms of Western media. So what do we know so far? An aircraft has come down. It's an Ilyushin 76. It's one of those um, uh, old Soviet freighters, four-engined, carries a a large amount of, uh, of people or of cargo, and was last seen diving out of control in flames towards the ground somewhere behind Belgorod in Russia with uh, flames coming out and cargo falling off. That's where the known quantity stops and where the disinformation starts. You have claims from Russia that it was carrying Ukrainian prisoners of war. Uh, 65 of them guarded by three guards and then a Russian air crew on top of that. So a total of 74 casualties. Now that's contrasted with what Ukraine initially seemed confident in announcing that this was carrying S-300 missiles. The reason between before the, the, the doubt as to what Russia is saying is partly because of all of the evidence that contradicts it that's already come out into open sources. The fact that uh, the the Russians were saying these prisoners were on their way to a prisoner exchange. It's true, one was scheduled, but the plane was heading in the wrong direction. Uh, The fact that, for example, some of the, the individuals on the lists of prisoners that Russia says were on board had already been exchanged at the beginning of this year. Lots of little details that simply don't add up. And yet, you see so many Western media around the world picking up on the Russian version of the story and reporting it as though it had some kind of basis in fact. Now, we don't yet know precisely what it is that caused this plane to come down. And you've got some uh, suspicion based on the way in which the Russian disinformation campaign swung into gear instantly mobilizing a lot of their disinformation um, vectors, mobilizing a lot of the people who swing behind their narratives and actually being very well coordinated, which is usually a sign that Russia's known something is going to happen in advance. In fact, some of the disinformation mouthpieces already appeared to have the images and biographies of some of these supposed Ukrainians that were supposedly on board. That's a real contrast with when Russia is taken by surprise by something that's happened, when it's uncoordinated, it's incoherent, and you have different sectors of the information warfare apparatus saying different things. So that fact that Russia appeared to be prepared seems, uh, or rather has suggested to some people that this may have been some kind of staged operation that Russia might have led Ukraine to shoot this aircraft down by, for example, suggesting to Ukrainian intelligence, feeding them deceptive information that there were, in fact, these missiles on board, missiles that have been used to bombard Ukrainian cities, which would make it a very high-value target. And anybody that thinks that, uh, that Russia wouldn't do this to its own aircraft for the sake of, uh, of a victory in information space hasn't been watching what Russia has been doing lately. It is reputationally damaging when these prisoner exchanges go through because the world once again sees the the systematic torture that Ukrainians are subjected to when they're in Russian captivity. And of course, compare that to the prime condition of the, the Russians that are being exchanged for them. And it is exceptionally easy now for Russia to manipulate evidence after the crash to support its version of events and try to prove to the world that they were right. They have secured the crash site. Uh, It would be very easy to introduce fragments of missiles to say this was shot down by Ukraine. It would be very easy to introduce bodies if they wanted to show that Ukrainian POWs were on board because, again, Russia has never been above massacring Ukrainian POWs. Think back to what happened in Olenivka in uh, July 2022. 
But all of this for the time being is still in the realm of conjecture. We simply don't know what has happened. And of course, you have the, um, the contrasting approaches to release of information on the two sides that is absolutely typical. Uh, Russia spinning its information warfare apparatus into top gear, Ukraine actually being quite measured, quite slow. Uh, and even though you would think it might be in their interest to get some kind of rebuttal out there rapidly, saying, please, everybody, hold on. We are investigating precisely what has happened and we're not going to comment on it until we are sure. If only Western media that were telling this story to our publics would actually be as restrained and as responsible as that. Uh, so, thank you for that. So, those of us who have um, been paying attention, following your work, following the scholarly work of, uh, you know, many of the historians who know what's going on, I look at um, the situation as the West having been targeted with information warfare, 2014 um, is really like the base where this version, this this great information war for, for from where I'm sitting really ramped up. Everything in your book, Russia's War on Everybody, lays it out. And yet I still feel like there is this woeful blindness, woeful ignorance uh, by major, major uh, swaths of the population that it's even occurring. And yet, as you told us before, it affects everybody. In your new updated uh, version of your paperback book, which was just released for on everybody, paperback, have you addressed this anywhere? Did you update it so people uh, you know, may able, you know, be able to kind of like, you know, really figure this out? Well, the sad fact is it really didn't need that much updating. Uh, in fact, if uh, anybody that's familiar with the, the first edition of the book will know that I wrote it in October of 2021 when the war with Ukraine was looming, but was not nobody knew when it was going to kick off, then rewrote it rapidly after the war started, but very little had to be changed because it was describing everything that was already going and was only confirmed by the launch of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So a year later, there's a new uh, preface, a new introduction for the, the paperback edition, but it doesn't change anything in the text of the book. It just confirms it. It's just more examples of exactly what's being described throughout the text of the book. And I think the from memory, the, the preface, the new preface starts with something very cocky along the lines of uh, everything that's in the book has been confirmed or, or got worse since it was first published. So those people who, that have already, uh, that are already familiar with the hardback or the Kindle edition, probably don't need to go out and invest in the paperback unless they just want to see that it's more of the same and the, the hardback edition was actually right all along. Wow, thank you so much for that. So uh, Hi-Fi and I learned something pretty important a few weeks ago. We are friends with a two-time Trump supporter who got himself out of what he called the cult of MAGA and now is forming an organization called Leaving MAGA. He explained to us the reason that the MAGA cult members, his words, don't believe anything about Russia when they hear it. As you said, Russia, Russia, Russia happened to be good propaganda. But he also said it's because they've been conditioned to believe that politicians always get help from foreign nations. So it's just no big deal. Meanwhile, I've been doing a deep dive into 2016 and it really is a big deal. We were under attack then. We continue to be under attack. Anything we can do to help wake people up. Well, that uh, idea that politicians always get help from foreign nations is a bit of a new one to me. I wonder who exactly it is that they, they believe that Biden is getting help from abroad. The trouble is, in the case of Trump, we know precisely who he's asked for help because it's been well documented. He's looking to Russia. He's looking to China. He's looking to Iran. In fact, his closest allies are the adversaries of the United States and of the West more broadly. And the fact that that is now being accepted as the normal and natural way of business in a way is akin to Trump's defense when presented with, with evidence of his criminal dealings. Not that he's innocent, but that he has every right to be a criminal and still run the country. So that is a, uh, a symptom, and it's just one of those many symptoms of this deep and pathological problem that is running so so permeate, permeating U.S. society so, so broadly, and the fact that people will sign up to this and blind themselves to things which only a few years ago would have been completely unconscionable.
So in that respect, it does resemble a cult in so very many ways. And I think it's entirely appropriate when people do uh, present themselves in that kind of altered state of consciousness and altered appreciation of the world to recognize that the symptoms are very much like those people who have been sucked into a cult and no longer recognize what's happening around them. Wow, high five. So one of the questions I have for you, and uh, maybe you're seeing it in the UK, not as much as the United States, uh, it, it is obvious, or it should be obvious, to those individuals who have access to you know, national security research, who have access to uh, well, just the media to see what's going on. It feels like our leadership, we're in a fight, and our leadership is doing nothing. They are standing there and allowing our adversaries to continuously punch us with this disinformation. Families are being destroyed. The economic situation in the UK because of Brexit is, I think, becoming deplorable. Um, where is the leadership? Why aren't we fighting back? Why aren't we doing something? Well, it's not everybody that isn't doing anything. So yes, across a big sector of the Western world, there has been a, an absolutely appalling failure of leadership to explain the problems that people are facing and what needs to be done about them. And you talked about it being a fight. There is the literal fight, the one that's going on in Ukraine at the moment, where Ukraine is the front line defending the whole of Europe and in effect defending the whole of the global security system that keeps countries, including the United States, secure and prosperous. So you have the frontline states that recognize the threat, the existential nature of the threat, and are doing what needs to be done, seeking to defend themselves as rapidly as possible. Poland, for example, basically quadrupling its defense budget and throwing pitchfork loads of money at the problem to try to get ready in time for the next Russian threat. But then behind that front line, you've got Western Europe, you've got the UK, and you've got even the United States, where there is a limited willingness to actually be honest with voters about the scale of the challenge, how long it's going to take, and in particular, how much it's going to cost, because conversations like that do not win votes. And coming up through 2024, we've got a lot of change coming up in the term in uh, democratic processes in elections that are happening really across the West, which may end up with significantly different leaderships in so many of these different countries. And in very few places do you see these issues actually being addressed. And that means, of course, that uh, as we've seen so often, it's not an issue within society. It's not up for debate in the media and in the way that it would be if there were key leader engagement. If you take the, the example of the United States, it is a strange phenomenon looking at it from the outside when the, the responsible mainstream media, those that are not politicized, the, the, the mainstream um, print titles, for example, Washington Post, New York Times, are presenting the upcoming contest as though it were between two politicians, two candidates with mildly differing policies. And it's really a question of, uh, of degree, who you vote for, as opposed to a statesman and a criminal, as opposed to somebody who wants to preserve American prosperity and security, and one who wants to destroy the institutions that actually protect it in league with the enemies of the country. Somehow that, that basic fundamental fact about the upcoming election doesn't make it through into discussion of it, where the outrages of Trump and the statements of Biden are presented in a kind of parity. It's just, it's, it's, it's phenomenal hearing it from somebody outside of America looking in because uh, that is exactly what's going on and that is exactly our war. Uh, you have an event coming up on Tuesday that uh, our viewers could actually attend if they would like to. Resisting Russia Information Warfare Lessons from Ukraine. Tell us some of the things that we can learn from Ukraine. Remind our viewers why it is so incredibly important that we support Ukraine. Well, those are two very different issues because well, Ukraine has been under attack in cyber and information terms now for, for a very long time. The, the report around which the event you're talking about is based is something that I wrote in the, the summer of last year, was finalized more or less in August of 2023, about the lessons that we could learn from how Ukraine has remained resilient and has actually defended itself against Ukra Russian cyber and information warfare. And there's a lot there that could be emulated by countries that similarly find themselves under the same threat, although not all of it. 
there are some things that are very specific to a country that is effectively at war, and it's hard to to see how they would be applied across the board. For instance, the the fact that Ukraine was able quite rapidly and efficiently to to take steps to protect its information space, to close down the outlets for Russian disinformation, to take government data that was stored and evacuate it from the country to for safekeeping because they were concerned that those places where it was stored would actually be overrun. That's very hard for a country which thinks it is at peace to do. And also, of course, you have to deal with uh, the constant factor of this patchwork of different legal, political, social systems across the West, each with their own constitutional setup, each with their own idea of what is actually acceptable when you're defending democracy against a threat like this, which actually exploits open societies. So yeah, right. take the United States, take Canada, take France, the UK, each of them has to have their own approach because each can only go so far in actually changing the current situation to defend itself against information warfare. Now, on top of that, there are some very Ukraine conflict specific uh, elements that came out from, from studying precisely how the information war had gone, some of which, again, may not be replicated elsewhere. One, for instance, is the way the tech companies, the major platforms, the providers of information and telecommunications services, the big global names, have actually weighed in on the side of Ukraine. They've decided to take a side on the, on the basis of their own values more than on the basis of their bottom line. So Amazon, and Google and Mandiant and cybersecurity companies, platforms, comms people are all providing a, a hostile environment within which Russia has to operate. But we can't take it for granted that that will actually be the same in future conflicts where the, the values might choice might not be quite so clear cut. So there's a great deal that we can observe just from the basis of the first 18 months as it was then of Russia's full scale war on Ukraine. And there are a lot of lessons that can actually be picked be picked and picked up from that, uh, that can be applied across various different societies in the West to make themselves stronger. It's just there is no one size fits all solution for everybody. Right. And we are almost at the two year mark here. And in America, we see the captured members of the GOP uh, stunting the ability to uh, get the aid that we need at the level that we need to Ukraine. Anything you can say uh, that you've observed there that could be helpful? Uh, there's a great deal that's unhelpful that we could say. Uh, basically, the, the crisis point, the crunch point that we were expecting, possibly with the arrival again in office of President Trump, has arrived early because the combination of the, the timidity of the Biden White House, which you have to set against the eagerness of DOD, for example, to actually support Ukraine and ensure that they, they can prevail in this conflict, has now combined with that political nervous breakdown triggered by uh, some in the Republican Party to cut off those fl flows of essential support to Ukraine that was actually keeping the country in the fight. And of course, at the same time, you've got problems presented within Europe as well, with individual members of the EU blocking their own pathways for aid. So it's now down to individual countries like the UK, like the frontline states, to attempt to fill the gap and attempt to continue defending themselves by supporting Ukraine to mount that forward defense. But of course, in terms of scale, that is far, far less than either the United States or the EU working as a bloc would have been able to provide if there hadn't been these sudden political fits. Wow, high five. So you just released a new paper in December of 2023, and that paper is entitled Russian Cyber and Information Warfare in Practice. And I think this is a brilliant paper. Highly suggest everyone go read it. But you make a couple of very interesting points in this paper. And one of the points you make is about um, civilians entering into information warfare and what does the status of those civilians become when they are engaged in information warfare? And the reason I find this interesting, if we look at social media now, we see a lot of social influencers. Uh, I'm thinking of someone like a Jackson Hinkle, right? It is obvious that he is aligned with authoritarian powers and um, he is working against the interests of the United States. So I like, how does, how does this get defined? Is it defined per country in their legal system? Is there a global uh, law that applies to this? I'm, I'm just, I find this interesting because 
a lot of people are getting caught up in this. So I'm, we used to call Tokyo Rose a traitor. Now we call them influencers. I'm sorry, but I just I'm I've had it up to here because I am on Twitter X and Elon Musk since our last conversation has released all of the uh, you know traders on the platform to go ahead and keep on tradering as far as I'm concerned. Well, not all influencers are traders. Some just want you to buy useless stuff. But yes, the the fact that the the Musk Twitter has now enabled all of these vectors of hostile influence against Western society is, it should be of greater concern than it appears to be. Mm -hmm. But um, Hi-Fi, your point about that report, that was actually the one I was referring to earlier when I said completed in August 23. Unfortunately, there was a bit of a delta between completed in August 23, finally published in December 2023 for various complicated internal reasons of, of publication processes that uh, I shan't bore you with here, but it is effectively the same thing. Now, where it's talking about the role of civilians and, in fact, the status of civilians when they're engaging in cyber or information warfare, there are two very distinct angles to that. The one I was covering in the paper was the way in which, as I mentioned earlier, now there is this direct engagement in the war by, for example, cybersecurity companies who are not just working on behalf of the government, but actually taking action in cyber warfare against attackers. You've also got civilian populations who are joining in and uh, forming what uh, Ukraine refers to as the IT army, for example. People who are taking direct action despite technically not being combatants. And that opens up for the lawyers questions of whether they're entitled to the protections they would normally expect as civilians. Now, mm -hmm. hold on one moment because nobody expects for a moment that Russia is going to respect international humanitarian law, law of armed conflict. However, there's still this broader issue of what happens in conflicts elsewhere. If the precedent has been set that you're engaging in this, not as a member of an armed service, not even as a government servant, but as a private individual, where exactly does that leave you in terms of legal protection? Now, the flip side to that is what HiFi was referring to, the way in which people can, with impunity, act as agents of a hostile power or, in some cases, multiple hostile powers against their own country. And that's a function of two things. First of all, it's that uh, legal and political and constitutional environment that I was talking about earlier, the fact that it differs in each country. And so there are different uh, possible remedies that uh, can be adopted in each country. Uh, in some places, it's illegal to be a foreign agent in some places, it simply isn't. So there just is not the, the legal means of tackling these individuals. In the UK, for instance, uh, last year, we had the entry into force finally of a new National Security Act, which at long last makes it illegal to work as a sponsored, as a conscious agent of a foreign power against the UK. Uh -huh. But then there's the second element of whether it's actually going to be resourced and enforced. And for that, you need the actual political will to go after these people, and that depends on recognizing them as a threat. So treating, for example, the, the individuals within the UK who are known to be part of the process through which Russian intelligence agencies hack material, then forge it, then dump it onto the open market, ought to be very straightforward, but it depends on the political initiative to actually treat them as a problem and therefore make them a counterintelligence target. There's no indication that that is happening so far, but again, it's patchy across different countries. And those countries that take the problem most seriously have done the most about it. I'm working on a report that's uh, looking at what some countries are doing right that we might be able to learn from them. There's been movement in Poland and Guatemala and Estonia. They got rid of a, a Russian propagandist priest in uh, Ukraine. They kicked out a cult leader. They too are uh, getting rid of leaders of um, you know pro-Russian churches there. They're taking it seriously. What can we learn from countries that are actually uh, taking moves uh, to protect their people and their nations from this type of aggressive Russian um, kinetic and non-kinetic warfare. Well, first of all, the lesson, as always, is that this can be done. You don't have to be a, a helpless victim of this. You don't have to be a helpless punch bag that is incapable of taking the initiative to protect yourself. And we see that not just from, from our area, but from around the world. You mentioned Guatemala, uh, two of the, the best case studies for protection against hostile external influence that we come back to again and again are actually well out of area, our area. It's uh, Singapore and Australia.
Now, bearing in mind, again, this really important point that the, the social and the political and constitutional environment in each country is so different, there are things that uh, Singapore can do to protect itself against hostile foreign influence that would be unconscionable in, for example, the United States or Canada. The, the POFMA, the Prevention of Falsehoods and something else which I can't remember, um, legislation to force social media platforms to correct disinformation is the dream of counter disinformation campaigners in much of the rest of the world. But look then at uh, the situation in Australia, where not only have they done what the UK has done and put in place the legislation to actually um, counter foreign interference across a wide range of different areas of activity, not just politics, also media, academic, uh, academic study, business, etc. But they've also resourced it. They've put people and money into making sure that this can actually be enforced and be a useful tool. Now, that, of course, was primarily intended to counter the, the growing and very obvious problem of Chinese hostile influence. But because, like so many measures that are intended to boost societal resilience and protect themselves against external threats, because those measures are universal, it works just as well for dealing with other problems, like, for example, Russia. Wow, amazing. I know Hi-Fi probably has one more question. We only have a couple of minutes left, but I definitely want to um, just let you know, A, how grateful I am for all of your work. Um, since 2016, I know that you wrote an important NATO handbook in 2016 about Russian information warfare. I have been uh, doing a deep dive on 2016 to you know, review uh, what actually happened uh, at that time. And I just feel like my, my, I don't want to use the word fear, but my deep worrying concern for 2024 um, is that too many people are obeying in advance and there's almost this resignation that it's inevitable that America is going to fall to authoritarianism and I, I'm punching back against that and this team punches back against that but I feel like that is the worst mistake anybody can make to obey in advance. And once again, I ask you, how do we wake people up, mobilize people, and get people to do everything to ensure that's not the outcome in November? Yes, I, th I think you're absolutely right. One of the most alarming things, looking at it from outside the US, is the apparent acceptance uh, by the broad mass of the population that this could happen and the, the there's nothing that could be done about it, even before you get to those who are actually embracing the, the chaotic and destructive future, because they think that is the way to, to solve America's internal problems. And one of the things that is uh, strikingly absent from the debate, again, within the United States, but it's very pertinent elsewhere, is the way in which anybody that, uh, that looks at Russia for a living and looked at the last Trump presidency was in absolutely no doubt that Trump was working on behalf of Moscow. For whatever reason, we don't know whether it was uh, because he was induced or, or uh, made to do so through some mechanism, or simply because his instincts were pre completely in tune with what the Kremlin wanted. Every single policy initiative, every statement, everything he did was actually furthering what Russia wanted for the United States and was very damaging to the, to the US itself. Now, he says, He's learned from the previous instance, and now he will be able to outwit and overcome those democratic checks and balances that prevented him from doing the worst damage last time. And yet nobody in the United States appears to be talking about this, about an agent of a hostile power that wants to take power and finish the job on behalf of Moscow. That appears to be a, a glaring gap in the whole conversation that's ongoing at the moment. I've been revisiting his words from 2016. I've been watching his videos. He is a superb propagandist. I listened to what he does. This was this was somebody who had to have been trained. I don't know that he could be considered a natural. Everything he did, Russia, if you're listening, inviting them to hack a presidential candidate's computer servers standing next to Putin saying he said he didn't do it. He didn't do it. And then talking nonsense and nonsense about servers. I, I feel like how could America have missed this? Or am I just naive to how much possible infection there is uh, 
within higher levels in this country that that was allowed to happen. I still, I still am. Uh, I think because I'm revisiting it, I'm having a bit of a, you know, uh, I'm in a mood about it. Let's just put it that way. The writing was clearly on the wall that this man was a foreign asset. He had the same handler as the, you know, president in Ukraine and had, they used the same, you know, slogans, lock her up, you know, it was just like, where, where were we? And, and here we are on the brink of 2024. It's just this horrible uh, rerun. And I want to disrupt it. I want to I want to change the channel and ensure that's not our future. Although we shouldn't pretend that we didn't know at the time. This was clear to anybody watching at the time. But there seems to be a collective amnesia since then affecting the US. And uh, all of that seems to have been parked in the really don't want to think about that draw. And it, front, once again, is emerging as almost a being presented as a legitimate political candidate. Yes, right. High five. So legitimate presidential candidate. Um, he only appears that way, I think, because there are people enabling him and people funding him and you actually talk about uh, one of the billionaires who enables him in your paper, uh, Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a billionaire. Elon Musk has control of arguably one of the largest social media platforms in the world. Uh, Elon Musk has Starlink. Elon Musk used Starlink to confound Ukrainian operations, which how a single individual is allowed to interfere with any country's policies or actions is beyond me. Um, we look at these problems we have. We look at who funded uh, actions in Silicon Valley. We have names like Yuri Milner, Uzmanov, uh, Sergey Grishin. You look at the billionaires in the United States, Peter Thiel. Elon Musk, uh, this Harlan Crow, uh, who's contributed to the overthrow of our judicial system uh, with Leonard Leo. It seems we have a billionaire problem that is global. It's not just, oh, it's only the Russian billionaires. Oh, it's only United States billionaires. I mean, if we look at UK, it's now referred to as London grad because of all the financial uh, chicanery, the money laundering that occurs there. How do you think when the people who are in charge of regulating this, who are the people in charge of treating this as a threat, benefit from this system? How do we break that system? Well, it depends, of course, what the, the this you're referring to is when, when talking about regulating uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, first of all, on, on Starlink, that does, um, in the, the paper that we talked about earlier, it is the, the most obvious example of an organization, a commercial entity, which is taking a direct role and a facilitating role in the, in the actual ongoing conflict. Now, that is partly because Starlink has provided the most obvious and direct and well-publicized benefits to the Ukrainian armed forces, but it's also in the news far more often the others than the others because of that very distinctive pattern of ownership. The, the fact that it is, in effect, answerable to just one man and one man who makes decisions quite rapidly and may contradict what he said the day before. That has meant that a lot of attention has been given to Starlink, but it highlights a much broader issue. The way in which the platforms have power and the way in which they can use that power, not necessarily for the benefit of the societies within which they thrive and they make money. So the fact that, uh, for example, social media algorithms have been exploited so effectively to undermine the societal cohesion within the societies that actually allow them to thrive looks very much like shooting themselves in the foot when you look back over the course of 10, 15 years and see just how much damage has been done by incentivizing disinformation on these platforms. Yes, it is a major problem, but the, the current social and constitutional setup in most of the countries where these organizations are based and where they operate simply does not allow them to be dealt with. Amazing. Uh, uh, there's so much more that I want to ask you, but I know our time is up here. I just want to thank you for many of the lessons that I've learned from you. Among them, there's no rear areas in an information war. 
Uh, Russia missed the Enlightenment and we are still living in its dark ages and to not ask binary questions when it comes to the why of Russia. Is there one last thought you can say on any of that to really help our largely American, but quite frankly, global audience of people who really care about this mind war that continues? Well, sadly, everything that you've said is is still true and has been true for a long time. Now, you mentioned the the sudden bursting onto the scene, onto people's consciousness in 2014 of the Russian disinformation challenge. That isn't when it suddenly emerged. That was when most people noticed what was happening. And there was a long, slow buildup before then where Russia was putting in place the tools that it would use to attack Western societies. The problem is those tools evolve, uh, but the, the countermeasures against them do not. And it takes a strategic shock of the kind that Ukraine had in February 2022 to actually get societies to take an interest in defending themselves against it. If we look for best practice in ensuring resilience, in making sure that the damage is as limited as possible, time and again, we end up looking to the most exposed countries, the frontline states in the case of Russia, uh, Australia in the, in the case of China, but we can learn from them. It just needs the political willingness to actually do so. And last thing I do want to say is in reviewing the Mueller indictment uh, against the GRU, and their work um, hacking the Democrats and hacking America in 2016. There's a line by Guccifer 2.0, which was a you know designed to obfuscate that it was the Russian military intelligence that was waging this war, where uh, in a WordPress blog, the Russian military playing that character said, it's totally not Russia. <laughs> Here's the thing. I know that you who study this know that, you know, sometimes it's really just not that complicated and that we overcomplicate things. Is there a way that you can inform us on just how to remember that what we are dealing with is, you know, um, quite often um, old tactics, same, old same, same thing, different day. Absolutely. It is not just social media. It also involves humans. And uh, the the counterpoint, which I'll, I'll try to reinforce what you're saying by actually giving an example where it isn't just Russia. I mentioned the uh, the relationship between Russian foreign intelligence services and the, their facilitators in Western countries who uh, who joined together in the hack, forge, dump campaigns, like the one that was waged against the DNC, like the one that's been waged against vast numbers of um, counter disinformation activists across the West and just critics of Russia. So I, I mentioned that it wasn't illegal to do this kind of thing in the UK up until very recently. There's a very well documented campaign um, by a Russian intelligence service, which is referred to variously as a Seaborgium, Cold River, Callisto, the different cyber security companies given them different names, but it's effectively the same people. What they do is hack people's emails, uh, lure them into clicking on phishing links, and then pass the doctored emails to information launderers who dump them onto the information environment in the target country for political effect. Wow. The people who do that are known quantities. We know who they are and we know what they do. It's just that nobody has actually stopped them yet. And just to, to illustrate one example of how brazen this is, we have a, um, uh, a member of parliament here in the UK for the Scottish National Party called Stuart MacDonald. He uh, went public about having been attacked by Cold River and his emails hacked and uh, in order to preempt the, the dump part of the hack and dump uh, combination. The very next day, one of our leading conspiracy theorists trumpeted on his blog, I have Stuart McDonald's emails. So not even concealing the fact that there's a direct line between him and the Russian Foreign Intelligence Services. That is how overt it can be. And that is how easy it should be to interdict some of these key links of the chain in the chain of delivering hostile information effects. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. The book is Russia's War on Everybody. The paperback comes out um, this Tomorrow. week. Uh, yes, UK, US uh, folks can purchase it. And um, and also we were going to put the link up where they can join you next week if they would like to for the uh, Chatham House event. And one thing I would like to say is we received a photo of you. 
um, very, very uh, dapper photo of you. And it looks like you're piloting a plane. Can you just <laughs> comment on that? That, uh, yes, dapper may be a little kind. It was a very, very long time ago. This was from back in the day. It was uh, playing with an Illusion 76 of the uh, of the kind that was shot down in, um, in Russia this morning, but doing it for a movie. It was immediately after the... Uh, well, actually shortly before the end of the USSR, and it was a glasnost Soviet-American rapprochement fairy tale based on an old book about people being uh, stranded in the Arctic, where I was playing the... Um, the RAF pilot of this uh, of this aircraft. Uh, don't worry about the aircraft types; they got very confusing. Hence the moustache. Hence the uh, being involved in this American movie. Long story. Absolutely appalling movie. I wouldn't recommend anybody watches it. But yes, it did end up with me in the hot seat and an L seventy six, and it was loads of fun. <laughs> oh my gosh! Hey, uh, one more thing. You're going to come back, right? Because I know there's a lot of breaking news going on, and we need more from you, please. Things are happening all the time. Yes, I'm sure we'll talk again before before long. That sounds like a teaser. It is. Let's yes. do it. Let's do it. All right. Thank you so much. Kira Giles, Russia's War on Everybody.